Welcome. This is Dr. Owen Anderson, and we're looking at Peter Vermigli tonight. He was an Italian convert to the Reformed faith and moved to England and was an important part of the English Reformation. And his, his uh, work on the, the Eucharist and on predestination are, are two of the topics that he's best known for. He, he had to leave England because of persecution under Queen Mary and uh, lived out the rest of his life in Strasbourg and Germany. Tonight, we're going to look at a selection from his commentaries on Romans 1. And then towards the end, he uses 1 Samuel 5 to highlight the points he's been making about Romans 1. In the lecture, I'm going to toggle between this uh, writing, where I'll highlight things, and then I'll toggle back to my notes so I can write down some things for us to consider. So he gets right into Romans chapter 1, 18 through 21 are the verses that people want to think about. And that has to do with what does the creation reveal to everyone? And I'm going to anticipate a couple, let me toggle here, because I want us to anticipate a couple issues that always come up. What natural knowledge of God is available to all humans through general revelation? This is creation. It includes God's general providence also. God brings the rain on both the just and the unjust. That's an example of providence. So it's both creation and providence in that sense. And, and some problems that come up pretty quickly are these. Does everyone already know God? Do they know God and act against this knowledge? Or is the knowledge available to them but they are in culpable ignorance. So we'll see how he develops those two, those two questions. Is everyone, does everyone already know God? This is innately. And so we'll talk about that. Is it possible to have innate knowledge? It's funny because the uh, grammarly always wants to correct when I say they are in culpable ignorance, two separate words into inculpable, which would be the opposite of what I'm trying to communicate. So back to this, for uh, quoting Paul here, he says, for what is known of God is manifest among them. And he says, the Greek reads, and he gives us the Greek, as if to say, what may be known of God, that is to say, because there are many divine mysteries we cannot reach naturally, such as that God would justify us freely and forgive us our sins through Christ crucified and restore these very bodies of ours to eternal happiness. So those things he just named divine mysteries, those are the topics of redemptive revelation. So it's not mysteries the way the mystic uses mystery, where it's like beyond all human thought, but mystery that God has to specially reveal how he'll do that to us. But there are things that are taught by nature. And so Paul says, what could be known of God is manifest in them. And here he declares what kind of truth it is that they withheld in unrighteousness it is the knowledge of things divine that they attain by natural light. Paul reduces all their knowledge to two principal points. The natural light gives us the everlasting power of God and his divinity. So that introduces to this idea, natural light. Say, so what is that? Tells us of the eternal power, and divinity of God. And then it says this, they knew that God is most mighty by the very fabric of this world. All right, so now he's giving an argument. They knew uh, that God is most mighty by the very fabric of this world. That's a kind of argument or inference. Uh, the fabric of this world. 
therefore, some truth about God. So it's not an innate knowledge. That's an inference. Of course, uh, remember that the uh, same world is often used as proof there is no God due to its apparent mismanagement. So some people point to the fabric of the world in all of its uh, apparent errors and say that's proof there is no God. So the inference has to be made correctly and respond to the very common objection. All right, and then he goes on to give some more arguments. Uh, Moreover, the suitability and utility of created things taught them the divine majesty, which consists chiefly in acting well towards all. So that's the general providence I mentioned. God sends the rain on both the just and the unjust. I missed this sentence. They also knew by the beauty, appearance, and variety of things that such great power was ordered by the highest providence and wisdom. So then you get to, uh, oops, toggle here, to wisdom. From beauty and order, the inference is made to God's wisdom. Again, people will challenge that and say, no, the lack of beauty is proof God isn't wise. But my, my point is just to say here, what's going on is an inference, not immediate knowledge. And he says, these are the gifts which God bestowed on the heathens that they abuse the gifts of God. Thus, the similitude used by Chrysostom fits them beautifully. And here's what Chrysostom says, early church father. Suppose a king gives a great sum of money to his servant to furnish his household and to enhance his splendor so that his wealth and honor should be all the more evident. Suppose the worthless servant spends it all on pimps and harlots. Does it not seem just and proper that this servant be punished? Just so do the wise among the heathen conduct themselves. So here he's speaking now, Chrysostom, about not all the heathen, the most wise among them conducted themselves as this worthless servant. When they received from God the clearest knowledge of things by which they should have worshipped and adored him, they turned it into the worship of rocks and wood and images. Therefore, the wrath of God was fierce against them with good reason. Okay, so... We will keep this question mark. When they receive from God the clearest knowledge of God, all are given clear general revelation. And up to this point, he is talking about uh, inferences that can be made by reason light of nature from creation or general revelation. So that's, we're going to see if he stays there or if he goes back to innate knowledge. And we're going to raise a question if that's even possible, innate knowledge, or is that like a square circle? But right now he means inferences by the light of nature, reason. You're seeing something and you're inferring a conclusion from general revelation available to all. And the wisest among the unbelievers had this clear revelation, and even they turned to worship the creation. So how much the more so the the foolish among the unbelievers. But here's a second problem that's going to come up. Is he saying they did indeed know this? They correctly inferred truths about God, which means they aren't unbelievers, they believe, or is he saying they are in culpable ignorance, even though they have a clear revelation, and you'll find in Reformed thought around this time, that problem is not often solved. Just like the one about innate knowledge and inference is not solved, the speaker, the the authors often go back and forth between the two. And the reason why we maybe are thinking more clearly about that is because uh, uh, critics pointed that out in next generations and centuries. 
putting out this problem and it needed to be developed more. It doesn't mean he was wrong. It just means he needed to develop this more. But you say, well, it's not his fault. He lived before David Hume or Immanuel Kant. So we have the benefit of living after them and we can see their sharp criticisms and that we need to do a, a stronger response. All right, so moving on. And this also brings up the wrath of God and that God is justified in his wrath. Now, moving on, by stating it was manifest in them and not it was manifest in all, he thinks that he's that it's speaking about just the wise men and philosophers from the crude and ignorant masses. I'm thinking uh, it means something different than that. I'll make a note of this before we go on. Uh, who is indicated by them in Romans 1? He thinks it is the wisest among the heathen. Um, I'm reading it, and, I, and others have read this way too, it as um, speaking of a historical progression. There was a time in humanity when this, uh, when they knew God, but they exchanged that knowledge for idolatry and suppress the truth by teaching this idolatry. So it's not that they thought it was the truth. They didn't think it's true. They thought this other thing is true, and they suppressed it by not letting it be taught anymore. Just like we would see, that's what we would say today, maybe the secular university suppresses the truth because it's teaching something else in its place. And then uh, he gives a list of things they uh, fell into, a list of behaviors they fell into. And so I don't think it can mean all humans that have ever lived. So I agree with Vermigli on that because the things he describes haven't been done by all humans. But there was a historical progression at one point among humans that did go from belief in God to these dark, the darkened mind and these kind of behaviors. But so now that, let's compare these two, my reading of it and his reading of it. He's thinking it means just the wise heathen. Um, Everything was not unknown to all alike, but it happened through the fault of these philosophers. They should have proclaimed what they knew to the people openly and forcefully. So here he's saying they did know it. They failed to do what prophets and apostles did, but with proud mind kept these matters to themselves and in a sense hid them, lest they be understood by all. In this regard, the letter to, of Aristotle to Alexander the Great is much spoken of in which he says that his physics were produced by him as if they were not. For he seems to write as if to make things obscure by intention, lest they be understood by others. And, and you'll see that sometimes among academics, they take pride in themselves in, in writing obscurely as if it's a, a dark puzzle that they don't want anyone to know the answer to. Moreover, by their reasoning, they defiled what may be known to be pure. When they understood that there is one God, so here he says they did understand that, which means they're not in unbelief and they concluded that he should be worshipped, they proceeded to reason among themselves as follows. Since it is improper for common folk to worship the highest divinity that is present everywhere, who cannot comprehend it, it is better to divide it and assign it to images, heavenly signs, and other creatures. They also acknowledge that the nature of God is separate from all corporeal matter, that is, it's a spirit, and therefore be worshipped in mind and spirit, but thinking the masses... So crude when compared to themselves, they could not handle this. They introduced external rites and ceremonies devised from their own heads by which those who performed them might think they'd fulfilled divine service. All right, let me toggle back now because I think we got some problems. So he seems to say the uh, Greek philosophers knew and understood God's power and that he is a spirit, not material. But they hid this from the masses and instead taught them to uh, worship parts of creation and visible objects. Now, that seems to me to indicate they don't understand. He faults them 
for understanding, but not like the prophets or apostles propounding this to the masses. But the argument they give that God is so far above us indicates to me that they don't understand. Paul actually corrects that in Athens, that God is him in whom we live, move, and have our being. And I know he's quoting from a Greek work there. It's relatively obscure work. It's not a famous philosopher. But the point is that Paul, Paul is saying God's not far from us at all. So I think in the same paragraph there, the same few sentences, he's both saying they know and understand, but also showing how they don't really understand. And that's going to be part of the puzzle we're going forward with and trying to sort out what's the condition of the unbeliever. So he says, by their feeble reasons, they corrupted what they recognized from creation in its purity, nor were they faithful to the truth that they knew. All right, so the problem there then is, the problem is a lack of faithfulness to what they knew. And new here means understood. Because that sentence just before that, or the first part of that sentence, you could have read it as, it appears to them, but they don't get it, which, which is how I would take it. The, the, the creation is all around them, and they're not understanding it. And I think there's numerous scripture verses that affirm that. He's going to talk about a few of them in a moment, but not all of them. So he says, they should rather have submitted to the highest power which they acknowledged allow themselves to be governed by the providence of God and trusting him in adversity. They did not do so, and to their shame fell on to despair. In his later years, Cicero cried out in a letter to Octavius, oh, that I had never been wise. And in his books on the nature of the gods, he introduces Cota, or Cotta, a high priest who says that he wishes he could prove to himself the truth of the existence of the gods. So this seems to indicate that they don't know if gods exist. Rather than saying they do know the highest God and don't act according to it. See, that second thing, the one I just said is called voluntarism. That the problem is in our will. We know everything we need to know, but our problem is in our will. Whereas I'm going to suggest that, and sometimes he hints at this, the problem is in both our beliefs and our will. We don't know what we should. Cicero didn't know what he should. Cotta didn't know what he should. Aristotle didn't know what he should. And he says, sometimes the more famous philosophers they were, the more infamous, li infamous life they led. As the poet accuses them, care for the life they feign, but follow Bacchus vain. So they, they want to appear wise, but they just worship the god of wine. And so God's wrath raged against them. A schoolmaster cannot tolerate the negligence of a pupil he is diligently teaching, who is meanwhile thinking and doing other things. Even so does God behave toward us, for he continually holds open the book of creation before our eyes. He is always illuminating and calling us, but we regularly turn our minds away from his teachings and are busy elsewhere. Therefore, God will cast us out as unworthy pupils, nor will he endure so great an injury with impunity. So then, in this last sentence, he seems to be saying, the revelation is there and we're not paying attention which I think is the, the correct way to read it, but it, it's ambiguous sometimes in the way he's phrasing things. So he says the uh, revelation is there and we are not paying attention, which means we don't know and don't understand. So continuing now to divine revelation, quoting Paul, for God has revealed to them, we gather from this all this, that all truth comes from God, for it does not spring from us, but there are two opinions about how it comes from God. Some say that it is because God has made those things by which we perceive these truths. But others, whom I prefer, hold that God has planted prolepsis in our minds. That is, anticipations and notions through which we are led to conceive noble and exalted opinions about the divine nature. These ideas of God naturally engrafted in us are daily confirmed and refined by the observation of created 
things. So the first option is God made things that we can perceive with our minds. But the second option is we have innate ideas. Uh, a third option he gives, but he says it's, uh, some say, proudly and wickedly, that they have learned these truths from Aristotle or from Plato, giving no thanks whatever to God for them. To be sure, these men were agents and instruments, but not authors. They speak much as an Israelite might, saying that he knew the truths of the law, not through God, but through Moses, who was only God's mediator and messenger, relating to the people matters whose author was God. It should be noted that although God is a nature so separate from matter that he cannot be perceived by the senses, yet he regularly declares himself by symbols and by what we may call sensible words. These signs, which have declared God to us from the beginning, are themselves creatures. All right, so let me toggle back here and uh, explain this. So a couple options of how we know. One is that uh, the created order reveals it to us, and we can perceive it there. And the other is that God implanted innate ideas of himself in us. Now, you might notice pretty quickly the circularity in the second one. Once you know God exists from other proofs, then you could say God, in creating us, gave us certain ideas. But you couldn't argue from the idea of God implanting innate ideas himself to God's existence. Interestingly, Descartes does try something like this, and it's called the Cartesian circle because it's a, a fallacy. It's begging the question, a circular argument. So it seems like we're going to initially have to rely on proofs of the first kind. And we can leave open, maybe God made us with this or maybe not. But if we have an idea occur to us, of, say, eternity, that isn't yet a belief. It's just an idea. A belief involves a subject and a predicate. So we might have some innate ideas, eternity, infinity, unchangeable. We don't get those from experience. But these aren't yet beliefs. Once we say matter is eternal, now we have a belief, but it wasn't innate. The innate part wasn't beliefs. And then on top of that, it's not even knowledge. Knowledge means you can give a sound argument for your belief. So knowledge isn't innate. It's an it's a, uh, ambiguous or, or misuse of the term knowledge. And, and, and I understand it's used that way sometimes because we don't really mean what I just described. We mean by knowledge something more like appearance. I'm aware of that. It appears that way to me. I know it. But here we're talking in philosophy, so we need to be specific. This is what knowledge is. And even if we have innate ideas, and I've left that open to say, sure, maybe these are innate. That's not a belief yet, and it's certainly not knowledge yet. Once you get to beliefs and knowledge, you're no longer in the realm of innate. You're more on that first option he gave. So if there are innate ideas, it doesn't really help us much, and it certainly isn't a proof for God's existence. That doesn't seem to be what Paul is speaking about at all in Romans 1. He's speaking about what could be known of God from creation. So then he gives an example, knowing the series of causes and their relation to effects, and clearly understanding <clears throat> that it is not proper to posit an infinite progression, they reasoned that they must arrive at some highest being, and so concluded that there is a God. Plato, Aristotle, and Galen have set forth these exceedingly well. So now he gives an example, not of innate knowledge, but of a proof. There cannot be an infinite regress of events. 
whether or not that's sound or not, sometimes I think that might be called the Kalam argument in some settings, but it, it, it need not be. It might be differently developed. Uh, whether or not that's sound or not is another question, but now he's not speaking about innate ideas. He said they reasoned. They formed an argument, and then it can be evaluated to see if their argument was sound or not. So he says, we must not neglect the sacred writings. They have also described the same path to us. He, so he talks about Christ pointing to the birds of the air, the lilies of the field, Solomon commending the ant to us, Isaiah saying that the donkey knows the manger and its Lord, but Israel does not. Um, so it's clear that, that, that we be taught many things by creatures. So that's interesting because those are sort of analogies, not, not the Christ one so much, but certainly Saul and Isaiah. Saul, Solomon and Isaiah are giving uh, analogies or allegories from the ant. And lots of religions draw allegories from creatures. Um, Christ is talking to us about providence and the trust of God, which he says. And then David in Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God. And among other books of the Holy Scripture, which abound in this uh, matter, is the dialogue of the book of Job. For the speakers he introduces were heathen, so that the subject is handled by natural reasons alone. And I love that because that's exactly what I said in my uh, book on Job and how Job is pointed to the uh, creation, to consider the creation. So he says, all these matters are handled all these matters are handled there so as to proclaim to us the eternal power and divinity of God. Among other things, what especially reveal God to us is our own nature, human nature. For we are made according to his image and likeness so that we resemble him most of all, especially in regard to the soul, where the foresight of things to come is reflected, justice and wisdom and many other of the noblest qualities, and also the knowledge of what is right and honest and what wrong and unclean. We're going to talk about that in a minute, the, the law. How do we know the law? Again, is that innate or is it by derivation or inference? So then he gives an argument here. Seeing that humanity and the soul did not arise by themselves but depend on God, it follows that we should by no means deny the very thing we owe to God, but yield it to him as chief and principal author. Thus we may conclude, again an inference then, that God foresees everything that is done and is a just judge of our deeds to whom honest things are as pleasing as evil is displeasing. And then he considers how Cicero denied that about God. But the psalmist in Psalm 94 affirms it. So again, here he's giving another argument. That humanity and our soul do not arise from themselves, but by another, which is God. So again, he's showing us how to, we, we can cash these out. Um, I say that's not a very well-developed argument, or we didn't know the objections to it, but at least he's beginning to give us arguments here. So he says, uh, everything in the world witnesses to God. The poet said, all things begin and end in Jove. So long as it endures, whatever is in the world has the power of God hidden under it. If this is discovered through inquiry and knowledge of nature, God will be revealed to us. So there again is inquiry and knowledge or inferences from nature rather than an implanted idea. So now he's going to look at some contrary arguments. He says, other places of scripture seem to disagree with this saying of the apostles. They deny knowledge of God to the wicked. All right, so good. Now, I told you, we'll get into some of these scriptures. And so he's taking it for granted that Paul means all persons, or at least the wise philosophers, all of them, believed a proposition, only God is eternal, and had an argument to show it. Whereas we don't even have this problem here, because we've said it's a historical progression where at one point humans knew God, but they did not retain that knowledge. They exchanged it for idolatry. But he has a problem, he has to solve, because he's saying they do know God. But the Psalms say, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. And we also have none on earth understand or seeks God. To make a lengthy recital, it says in the first chapter of Isaiah, Israel has not known me. 
But this difference may be reconciled as follows. So here's his solution. I'm gonna put this in our notes. He has a problem that he attempts to resolve. All the philosophers knew God and the uh, scriptures say none understand. In other words, the uh, scriptures affirm the sin of unbelief, but his reading of Romans 1 seems to leave no room for it. I gave an alternative reading above that uh, explains how there is unbelief. So we don't have that problem on that reading. But how does he solve this? He's going to tell us. So he says, uh, but this difference may be reconciled as follows. Convinced by created things, as Paul says, the wicked confess there is a God, but afterwards affirm such things about his nature and properties that may be well inferred that God does not exist. Epicurus, for instance, said that there are gods, but removed them from all activity, care, and providence so that he ascribed to them a completely idle happiness. When it is said that there is a God, but that he has no concern for human affairs, does not punish or hear those who call upon him, it appears that they allow to God in name only. Therefore, scripture denies they know God. For the true God is not such as they imagine him to be, so far as receiving help or enjoying the divine assistance are concerned. For them, he was just as if he were not, since they neither called upon him nor looked for aid or support from him. Moreover, some of them were so evil that they tried to convince themselves that God does not exist. They could not succeed, since their mind contradicted them and their consciences strove against them, even so, scripture judges them by their efforts and says they do not know God. Okay, now he's distinguishing between the uh, name God and the content of that term. So you could say God, but you mean something completely unlike God, and that's what the heathen do. But there's a problem in his interpretation here because he says they infer God from creation. They know God. So he can't have it both ways. What, what he would need to say is this. They don't infer what they should about God, and they are guilty for this. That's what he should say. I'm going to take my watch off because it's, it's hitting the board. It's going to make a noise real quick. It's hitting the keyboard. That's what he should say here, and that's really the solution we mentioned above. But here he says both they're inferring God, and they don't know the nature of God. So then it's like uh, they know there is a highest power. But that's it. Then they are still in unbelief because they could know so much more. So it isn't that they know God and don't infer the right nature. It's that they don't even know God. And that would have been a clearer point to make. And so finally, we should understand that knowledge of God is of two kinds. And, and so his solution requires that he ends up introducing two kinds of knowledge. One is effectual, by which we are so changed that we try to express what we know in works. Scripture ascribes this knowledge of God to the faithful alone. The other is frigid, by which we do not become better people. For we do not show through our works that we know what, in fact, we are doing. Paul speaks of this kind of knowledge when he says, since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, etc. And Christ will say to many who boast of his gifts and knowledge, I did not know you. Since knowledge, no, since knowing God in this way brings no results, scripture rejects it so much that not once does it give it the name of divine knowledge, but insists that God does not know the wicked because this is the way they are. Now, that isn't two kinds of knowledge. 
So to keep his solution, he introduces two kinds of knowledge. But the kind he attributes to the uh, unbeliever simply isn't knowledge. They don't have a true belief with a sound argument. Their belief is at best mixed, like a higher power, but more likely simply false. His focus is on its inability to change them. But that's really a different issue. And we're gonna to come to that here in a moment, his view of the will. That's really an issue of regeneration. And to say that they know, he's still holding on to his voluntarist view that they know it and can't do it. Although in his, the next section, it seems like he's gonna let that go. So this is what I'm highlighting about Vermigli here is that the centuries after him challenged the clarity of how the reformed theologians had developed this point. And those challenges allow us to more clearly develop the points. Uh, I, it doesn't mean that we're critiquing Vermigli and saying he's wrong, it's saying is ambiguous and it needs to be more clearly articulated here. Uh, this is really a matter of regeneration. And he does say that. He has a hard time keeping these two kinds of knowledge because he says there's only one truth. There's not two kinds of truth. But it's just that you could know certain things, uh, the kind he attributes to the unbeliever is more like awareness. As in, I, an atheist, am aware of what theists teach. So you could say, well, he knows what theists teach about God, yes, but that's just like saying, I know what they say about Gandalf, but I think Gandalf is a fictional being. So the atheist says, I know what they say about God. I just think he's fictional. So they don't believe in God. They don't have, they don't have knowledge of any kind. All right, let's keep going. I right, want the next page. Yep. This needs to go away so I can flip the page for us. I had to turn, there we go. All right, so how does this natural knowledge remove excuse? Therefore, Paul says, they are without excuse. God did not reveal such natural knowledge for this purpose alone, but it follows from our own fault. What Paul here says here seems to disagree with what is often expressed when we discuss works and grace. If it is true that by our own strength and free will, we cannot even fulfill the law, which we know, how will such people be said to be inexcusable? So he's wrestling with a possible excuse. You told me to bench press 10,000 pounds, but I can't do it. How can I be inexcusable for that? If what we say is true, they might easily be excused because they knew this law by a natural light, but lack the strength to fulfill what they knew. Therefore, they do not seem inexcusable. But Paul deals only with the excuse that could be made from ignorance. The weakness that is introduced now would not have been acknowledged by the heathen, for they ascribed everything to free will. I thought that was a fascinating sentence. They love to speak of their own free will, but they don't even have the power to do what they say is good. So therefore, they would not have said they were lacking in strength. All that remained to excuse them was ignorance. Paul now cuts off this defense from them, leaving them branded inexcusable by their own judgment. To admit that they were too weak while knowing what they should do would have proved Paul's point. Knowledge of natural law did not make them better because even if the law is known, it cannot change us or give us strength to act rightly. Therefore, we must run to Christ. Because he knew the Gentiles did not seek that excuse, he rejected what he saw as an obvious objection, that is, ignorance. So he's right here. Ignorance of the law is no excuse. The uh, unbelievers think they know, but they also admit they don't have the strength to do what they say is good. So that kind of knowledge is of no use to them. 
They need the kind of knowledge that would transform them, which requires Christ. But before we get to Christ, the need for redemption, we can't beg the question. We can't simply assume that's true and not prove it. We have to back up and say, well, wait a minute. Can you knowingly do evil? Or does the fact that you do evil always reveal a lack of understanding on something? And people will give common examples. They'll say, well, I had a friend. He was addicted to cocaine. And he would say, I know I shouldn't do it, but I can't stop. Well, so at one level, he's saying he knows it. But if you were to inquire of him about his life, I bet you'd find out that such a person had been pursuing pleasure as what makes them happy. And that eventually led down the road to cocaine. So he doesn't know what a good life is. He might notice some of the destructive side effects of cocaine, but he still wants pleasure. So really what's happening in him is a battle of two values and a revealing that he doesn't know what he claims to know. So ignorance is there in any example of, of uh, uh, a wrong deed or sin. And when the heathen says, I know God, well, ask him, what does he know about God? Well, he's the highest power and he's really distant. We can't talk to him. Well, that shows me you don't know God because that's false. So the basic state of unbelievers from Adam and Eve in the garden down to the present is unbelief. The uh, initial state or root cause of sin is unbelief. Failing to understand what we should understand. So we give people an easy excuse when we say they do understand, they just don't do it. And if you think of some verses that you think prove that they understand, we'll look at them and compare them to when Jesus says, you fools and slow to understand all that's been written. Or, oh, you of little faith, you still don't understand. And many, many more that show how those two are connected and that scripture recognizes the reality of unbelief. It is a thing. Nor can we admit the other excuse from lack of power. For such weakness came by our own fault. This is weakness of the will. That is through sin. Besides, they could not have been excusable since they did not even did not do even the little that lay within their power, namely the outward acts of which they are aware. So he uses aware here instead of knowledge. That's important. Yes, the atheist is aware of the Ten Commandments. So you might, in, a, in one manner, say he knows the Ten Commandments. He doesn't believe them. And understanding requires belief. For we are not so destitute of strength through sin that we cannot do much by outward works. In this respect, they show themselves worst of all. They conclude that they were without any excuse, nor could they object that they were forced to act sinfully against their wills. Therefore, since they did what was evil, both knowingly and willingly, they had no excuse. We should not think that God gave them this excellent natural knowledge in order to render them without excuse. That arose from their own fault. So I like this because a lot of people say, yeah, the purpose of general revelation is just to leave us without excuse. And he's saying no. The without excuse comes from their own fault. On the one hand, either they say they know the law, but they don't do it, or they're ignorant of the law, which is culpable ignorance. So either way, they're, they're guilty. In the first case, they're a hypocrite. In the second case, they're, they're uh, in unbelief. This much they profited from their sins. That the very doctrine and knowledge which they attained brought them to judgment and condemnation. Thus it follows that we should not be deterred from teaching, even though we see that people become no better, since, that, since by that doctrine the very things happen that God ordained for us. At the least, this benefit occurs. If men are not converted by God, they will be condemned by their own judgment and witness. So that's the thing is he's bringing this back. It's their own judgment that condemns them. If they say they know it, it's easy to show they don't know it, but they're saying they do know it, then they're condemned. And if they say they don't know it, they're also condemned. They should have known it. What God wills above all appears to be so that when he condemns and punishes, it will be just. The teaching which the traitor Judas received from Christ was useful to him at the end when he condemned himself. And he gives the example also of Pharaoh. Then he says, the reason why they are without excuse is declared in these words, who withhold the nate truth in unrighteousness. All right, so now we're getting to this next problem. What does it mean? 
to suppress the truth in unrighteousness. They attained enough truth to understand how to act towards God and their neighbors, yet they held this truth down in unrighteousness. So here he's saying, they again, they do understand, but they held it down. What does that mean? The Hebrews did the same thing in regard to the truth God revealed to them through the law. Since both they and the others have been severely punished, what should those who profess to be Christians hope for, who keep such a great light of the gospel to themselves without bearing fruit? So it seems to be this idea that you know it and you don't tell others. I'm going to suggest a, a different, more common sense in what, what it must mean. So he says, this teaches us that those, oh, that, yeah, that those who boast of Christ and yet live wickedly in the end surpass all of all others, however evil, in corruption and vileness. The truth is, in a sense, held captive with those who understand it. So key phrase here, understand it, but do not express it in deed and life. So the one could be hypocrites. They understand it, but don't do it. And I raise a problem about that to show that that's not what a hypocrite is. Uh, a hypocrite is someone who's inconsistent. They say one thing and they do the opposite, but that reveals that they don't understand. And then the other hand is someone who says, uh, doesn't even know what they need to know. So he says, is held captive because they don't do it in their life. It is bound and tied with change of evil lusts which break out of the lower parts of our spirit, darkening the mind and enclosing familiar truth in a dim prison. God illuminates it in our minds, but through evil lusts, it is overshadowed. We must not think, as Chrysostom warns us, that it can experience any change in itself for truth by its nature is unchangeable but whatever disturbance does occur harms our mind and souls in two words paul handled handles what aristotle in his ethics treat at length when he discusses the unstable person so here this is really good he, he does go to aristotle aristotle's uh teaching about weakness of the will. Someone who seems to act against what they know. And Aristotle basically says it's not possible. Um, he says it's like a drunk person reciting lines of Empedocles. So he, he, he knows the lines in one sense, but if you were to stop him, say, hey, fellow, tell me what these lines of, from Empedocles means, he couldn't tell you. So really, he doesn't understand. He's more like a tape recorder or a parrot. So uh, Paul, he says in two words, handles what Aristotle treats at length when he discusses the unstable person, asking how the rash individual descends to vices, even though he has a right opinion in his mind. Okay, good. A right opinion is not knowledge. A right opinion means you believe I shouldn't be a drunkard, but you have no real proof for it. And you also value pleasure. And so the value of pleasure wins out over your opinion about not being a drunkard. It reveals you don't understand. And so he answers that this happens because he is too much moved by a particular good that is presented to the senses. So Aristotle's view is that the uh, person has high hopes, but then there, it, it is basically the marshmallow test. A marshmallow is put in front of you, and you're told you can eat the marshmallow now or wait half an hour and look at it, but don't touch it or eat it. And if you do that for half an hour, you'll get two marshmallows. And the unstable person is like the kid who eats the marshmallow right away because it's right in front of him. He can't, he can't control himself for half an hour. I, I'm suggesting, and then he quotes Medea, who says, I see the better and approve. I follow what, or I, and I follow the worse. So I see the better and approve of it. But I follow what is worse. And, and he's living before Milton or overlapping. Will they overlap a little? Yeah. And Milton has Satan saying, evil, be thou my good. Now, is that possible? Paul teaches us all this when he says, the wicked hold down the truth of God and unrighteousness. The truth strives as much as it can to break forth into action, but is hindered by lust. 
At the beginning of the ethics, it is written, the better part of the soul always encourages and exhorts to better things. For God and nature have so framed us that we wish to express what we know in deeds. When this does not happen, we are approved by our own judgment. Now, Aristotle and Plato both have this dualist view of the human. Which can sometimes sound like Paul describing the flesh, but it isn't. By contrast, we need a united view of the human. So the Greek dualists think the lusts of the body fight the uh, better ideas of the mind and often win. The Christian says both the mind and the body are fallen, united. So, no, it's not like Aristotle who makes the mind good and the body striving against the mind, or Plato who does the same thing. No, no, they're both fallen. You don't understand and you don't do what is right. And if you claim to understand, I'll be very happy to talk with you and show you that you don't understand. And that's also true on the redeemed side. The conflict in the redeemed human is between the new and the old, not within one or the other. Both of those are united, and they're in conflict with each other, and sanctification is a process of the mortification, the killing of the old. So we don't want to adopt the dualistic view of the human. Although that is still very common, and Freudian and Jungian psychology still uses that today. So then he's back to two kinds of knowledge. Strictly speaking, to withhold the truth and unrighteousness is to refuse God's calling, which I would argue shows you don't understand who God is, which by its truth recalls us constantly to him. Thus, whenever we attain truth through study or observation of things, it will be most profitable to us to ask ourselves immediately why God calls us through that truth when he presents to our minds. By unrighteousness, the apostle understood in general whatever sin we committed against God or others. So Paul speaks of that truth which is naturally engrafted in us, as well as what we obtain by our own study. So again, we've already addressed this. Is there really naturally engrafted truth? We could have innate ideas, but that's not yet true. The proposition is true or false. Ideas aren't true or false. Both teach the highest things concerning God, nor can the injustice we commit blotted out of our minds. Yet the scholars of the academy, I love this sentence, the scholars of the academy tried to teach the same thing when they contend that nothing can be determined to us with certainty. Therefore, they would not have us embrace anything if we are sure of its truth, but want to us to consider everything as uncertain and doubtful. And that's still true today. There's no certainty. There's nothing that's indubitable. All things are uh, uncertain. And many Christian philosophers even proudly call themselves fallibilists. All beliefs are fallible. But neither of these could achieve what they ought. Or, no, I missed one of the Epicureans. Uh, similarly, the Epicureans try to delete from our minds the things concerning God imprinted in us by natural preconception, but neither of them could achieve. And let me, so let me make a note here of why. The uh, academic skeptics and the Epicureans try to delete our knowledge of God by arguing that knowledge is not possible or that there is no God. And now I think he's at exactly how suppression works. It isn't that they know it. The academic skeptics don't believe it, so therefore they can't know it. Knowledge means you have a belief and it's a belief you have a sound argument and the epicureans don't believe it so that's how suppression works what is untrue although believed by the unbeliever uh, is put in the place of the truth and you're not allowed to teach the truth that's how suppression works. There's some falsehood that people believe, nevertheless, 
And they say, you have to stop teaching what they think is false, but it's actually the truth. And that's what we see today. That's what happens in a secular academy or a public school. That's the suppression of the truth. It's no good to say they know deep down. No, they don't know. That's why they're guilty. They should be ashamed of themselves, and they should know that what they're claiming is true is actually untrue, but they don't know that. And that can, compounds their guilt. So then he gives a... So that the held here, held down in wickedness is held down in the sense of replaced with some other teaching. You may ask how it happens. The truth we have by faith is stronger for proceeding to action. So here's back to the two truths. Why is the knowledge of from faith stronger? And surely this does not happen because one truth by itself and taken on its own is stronger than another. Truth has the same nature on both sides. So here he concedes the real problem is saying there's two kinds of natures or just two, two kinds of truths. The difference arises from the ways and means by which it is perceived. Natural strength is corrupt, weakened, and defiled through sin, so that the truth which it grasps has no effect. Now, that sentence begs the question. You'd have to first have shown there is unbelief, which is a sin and resulted in the fall, to then prove that natural strength is corrupt and weakened. You can't use that as a proof in the first place, or you'd just be begging the question. Why is natural knowledge not enough? Because of the fall. Well, what caused the fall? Natural knowledge wasn't enough. By faith, but faith is joined with it, the divine inspiration and power of the Holy Spirit, so it apprehends truths effectively. But these are all redemption words. Faith, inspiration, power of the Holy Spirit, uh, effectual. This is assuming that there's been sin of unbelief and all other kinds that come from that. And therefore, you need the power of the Holy Spirit. So you can't use this as proof. You have to prove this. I hope you see the difference between those two. Hence, the difference is not in truth itself, but by the means by which we embrace it. This is why it happens that there are we are changed, but here we remain the same as before. So He's turning soteriology into epistemology, and you'll find many reformed people do this. And it's a category mistake. It's a category mistake. He's saying uh, the unregenerate can't know in the powerful way. They need regeneration. But again, that does indicate that somehow there's different kinds of truth. Him saying it doesn't, doesn't make it so. Uh, instead... The unregenerate don't understand, and they need to be regenerated to understand. There is a clear general revelation to all which has been ignored, and this is the sin of unbelief. In that condition, they don't have true beliefs. All of that is the right order. I haven't given you proof of any of it's being true, but I've given the right order. Clear general relation to unbelief, to the need for regeneration. Instead of, you do know the truth from general relation, but it won't have power until you're regenerated. Well, what is that giving you? The regeneration, power to do it. Well, then I, I, I do have an excuse because I wasn't regenerated. I didn't have the power to do it. So you, you don't want to go down that road let alone that it's a fallacy, it's a circular argument. So then he gives some examples from uh, scriptures, the um, young man who wants to obtain salvation, Zacchaeus. When they were spoken to, they understood. Zacchaeus was told, I'm coming to your house today, and he immediately got his household ready. Well, yeah, he, 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 uh, I'm not sure if we're taught that he was re regenerated then or some later point or just before that, but he began to understand who Christ is, and he acted on it, whereas before he didn't understand. 
Aristotle teaches in his rhetoric that it is a valuable testimony to have our affairs judged by our enemies. So it is most telling to hear in the book of Samuel how the Philistines, the worst enemies of Jehovah, witnessed to his power, declaring it so great that they could not withstand it. And they didn't even seek natural causes for the diseases that afflicted them, even though there were, would be natural causes available. Now, I don't think that proves they understood Jehovah at all. They're polytheists. What they were saying was, uh, hey, there's also this God in Israel who, in this case, seemed to best Dagon. But they didn't believe in Jehovah as I am, who is the self-existent one from eternity. Nebuchadnezzar is similar, and Darius are similar when they think about Daniel. Uh, I think they're different than the Philistines. The Philistines could be explained, and even Pharaoh, as just being polytheists and adding a new god to the pantheon. Nebuchadnezzar really did repent at the witness of uh, testimony witnessed by Daniel. Uh, Julian the Apostate ends by saying, you have conquered Galilean. But again, that could be like a polytheist. He, he just sees an enemy. This is, I think this is how the demons who say, it says the demons know and tremble or the demons say to Jesus, I know who you are. Uh, well, yeah, in this sense, you know you have an enemy and that they're winning. It doesn't mean that you understand your enemy. And he, he mentions demons next. And uh, the same thing for the Philistines. And the Jews may be taken to Babylon for precisely this witness. So this is where he's getting to second or first Samuel five. The Philistines arrived at some knowledge of God through their victory and capture of the ark, though not so great that they were reno renewed to eternal life. So they're aware of God as a powerful foe who can beat Dagon sometimes at least, but that's not knowing God. That's a misunderstanding of God. God's not just a powerful foe who can sometimes beat Dagon. So they're still in unbelief. It's not that they have knowledge but aren't renewed. It's not a conflict with the, with the teaching, be transformed by the renewing of your mind, be sanctified by the truth. My word is truth. All that teaches us that people who don't have eternal life don't understand. So any, I mean, this is where, again, it's a little bit ambiguous. He says, most of the Philistines felt the strength and power of Jehovah and so then he begins to say that the unbeliever may especially see the strength, power, and justice of God, and the believer may especially see the mercy of God. Like the Gadarenes who lost their pigs and told Jesus to leave. But it doesn't mean that God has two faces or two heads. God is always the same, bearing one kind of face, although he is not always perceived the same by all. So again, I think that just reminds us that uh, people have mixed and incomplete beliefs about God, which is what indicates they don't know what they should, right? And that would be true in any discipline. I don't know why people give the knowledge of God such a bad name by saying the Philistines knew God. If I, if I know something in geometry incompletely, then I don't know it. If I confuse two theorems of Euclid, so that I put together one theorem, but half of it is number two and half of it's number three, then I don't really know it. And I wouldn't get points. If I'm told, if I'm asked by my teacher to recite all three laws of motion from Newton, and I only give one of them, then I don't know them because I was asked to give all three. Same, we could do this in accounting. We could do this in history. If I'm asked to, uh, give the beginning and end dates of the civil war, and I can't, or I can only give one of them, then I don't know the answer to the question I was asked. So the same thing about God. You should know the eternal power and divine nature of God, you Philistines, but you don't because you're polytheists. So we've clarified ambiguities that often come up in reformed thinkers of this time. Later critics, I mentioned Hume and Kant, but there are many, saw these and made them objects of attack. We have the benefit of having lived after that. and can clarify so that these critics 
are silenced. So in one way, of course, it'd be unfair to ask him to silence Hume, although we can, if we're, if we're really trying hard, we can anticipate critics. So the uh, cases that we looked at, ambiguities, how do we know innately or by inference, what do we know Is there unbelief or do all know? Are there two kinds of belief or just one? What is a weak will and how does it relate to unbelief? And how is the truth suppressed? He, he said things that, that I think would be the right answer, but he also said things that would not be the correct answer. And so the fact that he's wrestling with both, saying both, tells us that he hasn't yet developed this. His attention was especially on the Eucharist and predestination. Those were the major challenges of his day, and so he gave great attention to them. Since his time, the major challenges have been to the knowledge of God, and we've had to, to give much greater attention to that. And so we've had to work out these ambiguities. So there's much of benefit in Vermigli, even as we see the need to work these out in more clarity to affirm there is a clear general relation of God, but there's a reality of sin, which re of unbelief, which replaces truth about God with falsehood and thereby suppresses it. And we're supposed to take captive all systems that raise themselves up against the knowledge of God.